All right, the sin of slander in the church. So last week we talked a little bit about um, how it is that God wants his church to be healthy. Okay, we looked at the Old Testament. We recognized even the, the nation of Israel, God's mindset was always that they would be healthy. He wasn't just interested in a physical group of people that he could call his children. That's part of it. But he wanted them to be spiritually healthy so that they could represent him and impact the community. And so we talked a little bit about what it means for us. We said last week, if you are a Christian, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, um, the Bible teaches that you have a spiritual gift. Okay? The Holy Spirit of God comes and indwells the believer, and with that comes a spiritual gift. Could be more than one spiritual gift, but at least one. And so the next thing is not just to say, well, I have one, and this is kind of cool, but then it's to use that gift to contribute to the health of the body of Christ. Okay, So that's what we looked at uh, last week. And so sort of this week is similar, but as we considered last week how it is that we're supposed to contribute so that the body is healthy, this week we're sort of looking at what should I not do in order to keep the church healthy. All right? So last week was sort of what can I do, what should I do, how should I think about the gifts that God has given me, what ministries to get involved in, what people that I can rap with or relate to and encourage. This week we're going to talk about things we should not do or must not do in order for the church to be healthy. So before we jump into that, and we're only looking at two verses, um, verse 11 and verse 12, okay? They're kind of power-packed, and I was purposing to finish chapter 4, which goes all the way to verse 17, but verse 13 is really a completely different thought, so we're going to have to save that for another time. So it's just these two verses, uh, verse 11 and 12. But before we jump into verse 11, we're going to just do a quick recap, or at least look at verse 10, which is where we were last week. Uh, the verse says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And so the idea in James, one of the strong themes running through the whole book is you got to be humble. Um, God's God, we're not, and in order for us to align as God would have us, we have to be humble. And humility is something that Jesus Christ taught us. He walked it. He shared it to us. Uh, Paul taught it. Like, it's just the economy or the currency of God's kingdom. It's humility. So whenever you see arrogance and all of that stuff, the me stuff, you can be sure that that's not God. Okay? Now, it will rise up in us. Doesn't mean that we're horrible people. Doesn't mean that we're not saved. But it does mean that there are still parts of us that still need to be aligned Then practice this thing called humility. Um, when you get married... It's a great opportunity to practice humility. It, it just is. And you all listen, mm-hmm. No, it is. Um, I, I, I miss that sometimes. I had an interesting night and an interesting morning. But, you know, God's faithful. We we're able to talk through some stuff. But humility, trust me, is the whole, oh, that is the humility. Then you add some kids to the mix of that. And, um, you know, humility all over again. So now, as a parent, you're sort of in charge. But... They don't belong to you, they belong to God, so it's just like, yeah, this conduit in between, and it's just like, mm, 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 yeah, mm. <laughs> but I thank God for that. One of the things that I have always remembered, it came from E.M. Bounds on prayer, um, no, humility, humility, e. um, Mori, Mori, book on um, humility, it's called, Mori is the author. He said, always embrace anything and everything that will cause you to be humble. So that could be the person crossing you off. That could be the plane being delayed. That could be your spouse. Whether you're right or wrong, embrace it. Because in and of yourselves, in and of me, I want to explore it and be the Misha. And I've never forgotten that. Doesn't mean I always get it right. But I've never forgotten that. So I want to encourage you with that. Let's embrace everything that causes us to be humble. Okay? So anyway, that's sort of the space that, um, that verse 10 ends in, and then we're going into verse 11 and 12. So I'm just going to read it through these two verses, and we'll come back and look at some thoughts. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And that's the verses that we're going to look at. So it starts off by simply saying this. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Don't do it. Don't slander one another. So the next thing that we have to figure out, well, what is slander? All right, this is the definition in the dictionary. The action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. 
That's what slander is. Now, you would think that James is not needing to address this or write about it remotely in a church that is honoring God and purposing to live for God and align their lives to God's word. But remember, James is writing this to Christians. And he's saying, brothers and sisters, do not slander. Now, whenever in Scripture you find a command being given, we have to make the assumption that the command is addressing something that unfortunately is happening. So you can't just say, well, this was just some nice rules and stuff. Yes, God's God, and he gives us that Ten Commandments. I get all of that. But in the practical space in which uh, these authors in the New Testament are writing to churches, he's saying, don't slander. So the reason that that is being written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God is it was happening in the church. It was happening in the church, all right? People were making up false statements. People were saying things. Maybe it was because, you know, we grew up in different parts of the country, or you got more money than I do, or I don't like this about you, or whatever. But false things were being made up and said in order to damage somebody. And the Apostle James says, don't, don't do it. Now, slander is a devastating sin, and it's very easy to get started. While most sins... You need sort of the circumstances in order to, to do the sin, right? Like, if you're going to steal something, one, you've got to have something to steal. You've got to have, you know, I don't know, if it's a store, you've got to break into it. You've got to, there's some circumstances needed for that kind of sin to take place. With slander, you don't need those circumstances. All you need is the heart that says, I'm going to take somebody down. And that happens individually. Like, you don't need, like, this whole elaborate police aren't involved. Or not. They may get involved later on. But it's just one of those sins. It's devastating. But you don't need all of those circumstances. All you got to have is a heart that says, I'm going to take somebody down. Brother and sister, well, we may go to the same church, but that's as far as it goes. We may go to the same church. We may even be in the same ministry, but uh-uh. And all it takes is that, that heart that deceptive heart, that deceiving heart. Slander refers to mindless, thoughtlessness, careless, critical, derogatory, untrue speech directed against someone. And so this can be done verbally, of course. This can be done on Facebook. It can be done on Instagram, WhatsApp. You know, just a little bit of something, just a little bit of something that you introduce. It's, it's, it's similar to gossip in a way, but slander is just like gossip is sort of you hear something that maybe you didn't make up, but you heard it, you shouldn't really be listening to it if it's about somebody else and they're not there to defend themselves. But it's a little bit different. Slander is just like, I'm making it up. And I have a purpose, that's to elevate myself and cut you down. And that's what was happening in the church. Now, God, from the beginning, this isn't a New Testament thing, God says, do not slander. And you find it in Scripture over and over and over again, which means that God had to keep telling people to stop doing it. So I don't want us to think that, wow, this is way beyond me. Like, this could never happen to me. I would never do that. No, I'm trusting that that won't be the case. But don't think about it in terms of, well, that's those Old Testament persons, and, you know, they just didn't have everything together. Or these Jews, Christians that James talking to, well, I'm more advanced or more mature. Don't, don't, we have to look at Scripture and appreciate the whys as to why these commands are given. So that's for us. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16, this is what God says. He says, do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Interesting. He links slander with endangering someone's life. Oftentimes, we don't think about it like that. Oh, it's just words, or it's just a little white lie, and, you know, it's, it's this. Or, but, no, it's dangerous. It endangers someone's life. Now, we know that because even in, in law, there are laws that stop people from slandering, right? You can get into trouble. You can go to jail for it. So it's a legitimate thing. But God from the beginning says, don't do it. Don't do it just because it's like this flipping thing that comes off your mouth. When you do that, you are literally endangering someone's life. That should never happen anyway. Surely not in the church. Surely not in the church. Then that's what God says there. First Peter 2, 1, Peter says a similar thing. He says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Interesting, slander of every kind. You mean there's lots of different kinds of slander? It can be. It all comes from the same kind of heart, but there could be lots of different ways that we slander. So we have to be careful. 
Again, James is writing to those who believe that they are Christians or name the name of Jesus. So he says, do not slander one another. So to help believers control their tongues and avoid slander, James exhorts us to examine four areas of our thinking. The first is what we think of others. Okay, so if you're taking notes, write this down. This is some good stuff. I was trying to take it all in as I was studying it. It's a great outline um, that Joe MacArthur helps us with here. But he says, in order to avoid slander, consider what we think of others. What do you think of others? You better than them? Are they able to come into your circle? And we're talking brothers and sisters here in Christ, right? The second is what we think of the law. Like, how does God's word have authority in my life? Like, what do I think about it? When I am at a crossroad and I want to do something and God's word says something else, how do I decide? Do I just sort of go in the middle and say, well, yeah, it'll be all right? Or am I, no, God's law is God's law. God's word is his word, and I'm going to align to that. So what we think of the law, what we think of God, okay? So what we think of the law and then what we think of God. Because the two go hand to hand, all right? If God's saying one thing and it comes from God's heart and we say that God is sovereign and we celebrate and praise this awesome God, but now we think that we're on par with God and we can sort of be optional about what he says, then there's something wrong with our thinking. And then what we think of ourselves. So all of these four things are captured in these two verses, so that's what we're going to look at uh, right now. The first is what we think of others. James goes on and he says, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them. Now, the idea of judges there, sometimes I know in Scripture and at least in this society that we live in, you know, people say, don't judge, you can't judge anybody. The Bible does not say that, not in that context. The Bible says that we need to be not hypocritical about how we look at somebody else when we haven't examined ourselves. Now, does the Bible literally say do not judge? Yes, it does. But it doesn't mean like, the, that's like saying you're driving down the road and we're in Bermuda, we drive on the left side of the road. Someone from America used to driving on the right side of the road and we say, well, it doesn't matter. We won't judge, we'll just let everyone. No one does that. And that is not what God means. God's saying, make sure you are looking at this thing from the right perspective and that you're not being hypocritical. Now, the idea of what James is saying, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, the word judges, it doesn't mean like to evaluate like, okay, they're in a tough situation. Um, it's a tough, I may have to speak something difficult to them, but I do love them and I hope that they come out of it. And I, that's not what that word means. The word means to condemn. It's a mindset that says, I'm going to pack this person up in a box, and I'm basically going to wrap it up, lock it, and throw away the key. Like, they're, they're cut off. I may go to the same church. I may name the same name of Jesus. But when it comes to these people or this person, I'm going to say things about them because I've already put them in a box that I am not willing under any circumstances to let them out of. So that's what James is talking about there. Okay, he says, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, that's the word that he's used there. It means to condemn, um, and that demonstrates pride and hypocrisy, okay? Now, the first step in avoiding the sin of slander, we might say to ourselves is, okay, then I won't say anything. You know, if my mouth gets me in trouble, then I just need to learn to close my mouth. That's not it. The way that we... Avoid slander is starting to think about people in the right way. It's not, let me just sit my mouth. Now, granted, there may be times that you and I need to practice that. One of the things, I, I discipled a couple of teens here and there and even my kids, uh, and I try to live this out for myself. Everything that you think does not need to come out of your mouth. <laughs> okay? It's just true. Everything that goes through here need not come out of your mouth. No, it doesn't mean that we leave it up there and say, well, that's my garbage and I'll just... No, as Christians, we need to look at this thing spiritually. So if I'm having some thoughts, the first filter should be God's word. I'm not saying we always get this right, but we should at least have a game plan, right? But everything that we think, it ought not come out of our mouths. It might be an opportunity for us to, you know, hear it, filter it through God's word, say it quietly to myself again. God, what do you think about what I think? Get it right. That might mean it has to come out in the right way for the right reason. Or not at all. You know what I'm talking about, right, Connie? Connie's like, oh, I go. No, it's true, though. Everything that we think need not come out of our mouths. 
So the, the, the first thing that James is addressing here is we need to see our brothers and sisters in the right way. Now, we talked last week about the authority that we have over, in a sense, each other because we're all connected to the same body. We belong to each other. But you got to understand, as do I, that the head of the body is Christ. We belong to each other, but we don't earn each other. Christ earns us. And so we have to deal with our brothers and sisters like Christ wants us to because they don't belong to us. They belong to Christ. You can't go to somebody else and say, well, you ought to do it this way with your stuff. Or I think you should. No, you go to the person who is Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, how is it that you want me to relate to your stuff and your people? And we have to do it that way. So the first thing that we have to do is see each other the right way, all right? See each other the right way. We can't judge or condemn. Can't lock people in, in a box and say, well, they're no good. Nothing's ever going to come out of them. Or you know what? They don't like St. George's, so whatever. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, Pastor, obviously. I would. <laughs> he, he's like, I'm all right. He'll be <laughs> I know. <laughs> all right. So we've got to make sure that we're thinking about each other in the right way. The next thing that James says is, um, in order to avoid slander, consider what we think of the law. Consider what we think of God's law, his written law. What's from his heart for us to understand about how it is he wants us to live this life here on earth. So that verse goes on. So he says, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them, just talked about that, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it. So you're saying, well, wait, no, no, no. I was just talking about a person. Now you're going deep. Like, how does me slandering or, you know, uh, talking against a brother and sister, how does that equate to, like, you know, this law bit? Because now that sounds, like, kind of heavy. And this is very important because we have to understand when we sin and what we do, the implications of it based on what God says, based on his word and what he always determined should be. Because sometimes if we're doing the evaluation, we're like, well, that's not that bad. You know, it's not that bad. After all, Sister Sansa, she does it much worse than I do, right? <laughs> but we have to see things in the way that God sees things. And so this thing called slander is not just a violation of the law, but, I mean, it's not just a violation of a person, personal interaction and relationship, but it's a violation of the law. Because the law is basically love expressed in written form for us. Like, that's what God gave us the law for. He didn't give rules, commands to prove that he is God. He is God. He didn't ask us. Genesis starts with, in the beginning, God. He doesn't start by trying to convince or anything and all the rest of it. But what we do sometimes is, you know, we have our own evaluation of things, and we try to create what's comfortable for us. But God's law is love codified. That's why his law is. Everything about his law is about love, even the Ten Commandments. If you go through that, you'll find that they all link to a specific heart that says, love God and love other people. That's it. So this is what Matthew 22, 36 to 40 says. Jesus replied, and the backdrop of this, you got this, 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 this smart lawyer, Pharisee guy, and he's coming up to Jesus one day, and he wants to impress Jesus with how smart he is and how much he knows about the Lord. So he comes up to Jesus and basically says, Jesus, I know you're smart. You just put down those other guys. They had no answer for you. But I'm pretty smart too. So let's talk. Let's talk as like intellectuals because, you know, we can rap like that. And so we ask Jesus, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? Like, what's the most important? Like, sum it all up. You've done a lot of teaching. You just put those other Pharisees in their place. But, you know, rap with me. Like, what's the most important? And this is what Jesus says. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Did you get that? Verse 40. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Those two commandments are about love, loving God and loving others. So what Jesus says there, which is coming out of Deuteronomy and which James picks up there, is the law is love. The law is love. Now, you and I sometimes see the law as all of these rules and regulations and all the rest of them, but they're more a lane to ensure that love is the end result. That's just what it is. And so all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, he says, all of them. So the problem with slander is this. 
if you and I slander, but the economy of God's, or the currency of God's economy is love, slander and love are opposites. They're completely opposite. So if you or I habitually slander people, and we're okay with it, and we justify it, after all, I grew up down Bay, or this is just who I am, then what we're saying is God's law might be his law, but it don't work for me. So I have to re-sort of twist it, and I have to, 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 to present it back to God and do it sort of my way. And so that's the idea. He's saying when you judge the law, you're not keeping it but you're sitting in judgment of it. In other words, if you slander somebody habitually, and this is going on in the church, not our church, I'm talking about James, but if this is your habitual uh, demeanor and this is what you do and you've justified it, what you've done is nullified what God said is the most important currency of his whole kingdom, which is love. And if you're okay doing that, you're judging what God says should be. And when you do that, you're sitting in judgment on it as if you or I can be like God and rewrite what God says should be. And that is a very dangerous place. And that's the idea. So slander isn't just a word, it's the heart. If you and I are slandering people and we're okay doing it and it's habitual and we justify it and we say, well, they do it, or that church did it, and all the rest of it. What James is saying here is you're completely missing what God's law is all about, which is love. So if you're habitually doing that, you're not allowing God's law to be God's law. You're now judging it as if God got it wrong and you got it right. And that's the point that he's making there. So we got to be careful to get away from this thing called slander and avoid it. we got to look at people the right way, see each other as brothers and sisters, And then we all got to understand what God's intent was from the beginning. And it was to love him and to love each other. There is no place for slander in there. And God judges that very swiftly and very decisively. You'll see that through scripture. Slander is not a good thing. Okay? Now, the other thing that we have to keep in mind, just because slander uh, is illegal and you could get into trouble and you could go to jail, all of those things are true, that still can't be the reason why we can't slander. We don't slander because God's law says not to do it, and we understand that love is what God wants us to do, and we're going to see our brothers and sisters as co-equals, earned by Jesus Christ, and we love from that place. That make sense? So we can't do this thing like, well, we can't make up our own law, because when we do that, we're judging God's already established law as if we know better than God, and if God needs to change it for our convenience. And that's the idea there, all right? It's a very dangerous place. The third thing is what we think of God, all right? So it leads on right into this. If we come to a place where God's law, he might have said it, but it applies to those people, not me, because I'm smarter, I'm more mature, and, 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 and then that's going to consistently lead us to a place of, well, I don't think God is really a sovereign and has the authority that he says that he has. And so I'm a co-equal with God. We hang out. And you'll hear some crazy stuff nowadays, like, um, I don't know, you probably see some preachers on TV and some different shows and stuff, but it's like the familiarity that some people present is mind-boggling and it's dangerous. It's like me and God are chums. We play marbles back in the day. Like, that's the, the way in which, that's not God. That's not the kind of relationship. No, it doesn't mean that we should be afraid of him, but we should live in reverent fear of God as a holy God, as the omnipotent one, omniscient, sovereign, that's who God is. So we can't get into this thing, well, God, yeah, the man upstairs. What man upstairs? Are you kidding me? This is God. This God. So this familiarity, that's not to say the same that we should not dwell and, and, and be relationally connected with him, but the familiarity as if, like, we grew up in primary school and playing marbles and stuff. Uh-uh. Not God. Not with God. So this is what it says in verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. So, again, the idea is if you and I get to a space of saying, well, slander, a little bit here and there is not too bad. I mean, after all, that person deserved it. We're, as we just said, already determining that God got it wrong and his currency of love might apply to nice people, but I'm going to slander this person because they just got on my nerves and after all, I'm better than them or all the rest of it. We've already started to rethink what God said and judged it in terms of, God, you got it wrong. Do you really know that person? And that leads to the next space, which is this, familiarity with God. 
James says, there is only one law, lawgiver and judge, and it's not you. That's the idea. You, you, you can't get to a place like, well, you're going to tell God, God, let's sit down and rewrite some of your rules and your laws and all that. Like, that's arrogance. That's pride. And so that's what James, there is only one lawgiver and judge. And the idea of a lawgiver is the one who puts the law in place. Like, he established it. It's there because he put it there. And the idea with judge is the one who can aptly apply it rightly every single time. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. He said, the one who is able to save and destroy, like you're arrogant enough to think that you can rethink God's law, judge it, which takes you to a level on par with Satan because Satan went through that whole thing. Satan said, listen, I want to be like God. I want to ascend to the highest. I want to rap with God as if we're co-equals. That didn't work out so well. And it's the same for us. When we get to a space of familiarity where it's just like, you know what? Yeah, that's what the Bible says, but, you know, I, you really need, need to follow that. Me, I'm a little more mature. I, I know God in a different way. And you hear stuff like that today. But this is the space in which James is saying it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, and it's not you. It's not you. It's God. We have to follow God. We have to follow his laws. We have to follow his decrees. We have to pursue him, do it his way, because he's God. He is the one who can save or destroy. He's the one who brings salvation. He's the one who destroys, and that's a very general term. That could be final judgment in hell. It could be just even living it out now. But that's God. He's the sovereign one. So we can't get to a place of saying, well, slander's all right. No, because we're missing that God's whole currency is love. And then we can say, well, you know, God, you got it wrong in your law. I know what it says, but that's inconvenient. Like, do you know where I live? Like, do you know who works in my office? Like, do you know who goes to my church? Like, that don't work. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? But we do that sometimes because we want convenience, right? But we can't do that because when we do that, the continuing continues, which is, you know what, God? Let's rap. Like, me and you can just rap. Like, after all, I've been in church longer than all those other people. Like, you know, well, we have a special relationship. Um, doesn't work. Job had to find that out the hard way. And the Bible describes Job as a righteous man, right? He didn't have any sinful intent. He was a man, so there was sin. There was things that he had to deal with. But he had a righteous heart. And with some counsel from his dudes, which didn't really help him a whole lot, he has this conference with God. And God's like, uh, Job, you want to sit down at my table? Come, 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 come. Let's rap. So it wasn't Jerob saying to God, let's rap. God says to Jerob, no, 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 come, let's rap. Um, do you know where this comes from? Do you know how I did that? Do you know how I did that? Do you know why that happens? Do you know? And of course, Jerob could say no, right? We have to live in reverence of God. We have to live in reverence of God. The last thing he says is this. What we think of ourselves, okay? So that's just the list there. So what we think of others, what we think of the law, what we think of God, and what we think of ourselves. And that's the last part of verse 12. But you, who says, and that word, but you, is like really calm and nice in, in, in our English. But it's like, it's this term that says, okay, hang on. Pay attention. Are you kidding me? Like, that's what the word actually means. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, if we were to up grade that to where we are today, we'll say, like, who do you think you are? <laughs> like, who do you think you are? Who, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And again, the word judge there is very important. It means to condemn. Okay, we're not talking about um, the biblical principles of seeing a brother or sister in sin and having to come alongside them with the truth of God's word, which says, listen, I noticed that you are thinking and behaving like this, but God's word says that you need to do it this way, so I'm coming as a brother and sister because I want to see you restored and aligned based on what God's word says. God commands us to do that as a church. But this judging is not the same thing. And you have to be able to distinguish this in your mind because you will probably have conversations with people at times and the thing that they throw out, the Bible says not to judge. Well, yeah, it, it, this is what it means. It says not to condemn, but we have to judge behaviors based on God's word. He's called us to do that. 
So there's a difference there. Don't let people beat you up with that. That's not what the Bible means when it says that. That's not, okay? Again, tell them about the car um, scenario I just did. It makes sense. You can't just say it doesn't matter. Can you imagine, like, um, you know, you're playing tennis, and, and somebody wants to come and play cricket on your tennis court? And you say, well, no, we don't do that here. Why not? Well, we have rules. Like, we have, I, you ju we judge every day. But we make sure that you judge on the right criteria. That is the point. You can't just condemn people and say, you know, whatever, and you'll never be, and God don't love you. He loves me better, and you can't do that. Can't. So that's the idea, all right? But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? The only way that we can get to this place is that pride and arrogance. So if you were looking at those four things, it's a growing continuum of pride that now results to I'm better than everybody else. First, it was looking at other people as if they were lower or different than I. Next, it was, well, God, I see what your word says, but surely that can't apply to me because, you know, I get it right. I think you got it wrong in this way. Um, and then that leads me to, well, God, you know, since I'm able to reinterpret your law for you because you didn't quite get it right, I guess that means that I'm on par with you. So let's wrap and let me tell you what other, what other things you got wrong or what other things might need to shift for my convenience. When we run that continuum, we find ourselves in a place which is like, wow, I'm, I'm, I've arrived and, you know, I can judge, I can condemn and, and it's very dangerous, very, very dangerous. And that's what James is saying. James is saying, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? You're not God. You're not God. You're not God. And so this is my encouragement to each and every one of us. We're talking about slander. Slander is, it's, it's sinful, it's derogatory, it destroys people, it's wrong. But then the next question is, well, if that's a problem that I have, how am I supposed to get out of that? Like, maybe I have a loose tongue. Maybe I like listening to some gossip. Maybe I like, you know, the, 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 the chewy gossip of the day, and I can, like, how do I get out of that? Like, how does that change? Like, what's the formula for getting out of that? I want to encourage you with this. The formula for getting out of anything that we need to get out of is the gospel. It's the gospel. One thing Pastor Eversley has said previously in one of his messages, like, too often, we get excited about the gospel in terms of it being the means of us coming to God, entering into our relationship with him. And it is. We need the gospel. But in order to live for God, we need the gospel to continue to be applied in our lives every single day. So the same way that God, by his spirit, wants to come in and truly transform us and live out the life of Jesus Christ, that's the same way that we deal with slander and other sins in our lives. It's not by just like, you know, having a check-off list. Yes, strategies are important, so I'm not saying that that does not matter. But the motive behind it or, 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 or the power to even follow through with those strategies, it will never come from a piece of paper and a pen. It comes from the power of God. It's the power of God. So the gospel that says that God loved us enough even when we were at our worst, to send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, the power that was exerted when God raised Jesus Christ from the dead three days later, the power that was continued to be exerted when he went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit of God came, that is the same gospel that saves us, but it's the same gospel that we have to see incorporated and lived out in our lives on a daily basis. Because sometimes what happens is we get saved and we're excited about that. But no, somehow I guess we think like the church is what's going to keep me going in the right path. No, I'm not minimizing the church. But the only reason that we come into the church is by the power of the gospel. So the only way that we're going to continue to live out the life God wants us to live is from the power of the gospel. And it's this, God changes lives. So what happens sometimes in a Christian experience, and I have experienced this, is that we get saved, we're excited about the drastic change that God made in our lives. Praise God for that. But then we get saved, and then we're confronted with all the other junk that still needs to fall away, but somehow we don't think that we still need the power of God to help us with that junk. And so we get used to it, and we're like, well, I guess this is the Christian experience. It's better than it was, so I'm okay with that. But no, 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 no. The same power 
The same power that God used to save you and I is the same power that needs to continue to be exercised and appropriated and lived out and incorporated and used in our lives to break slander, sin, pornography, whatever. It's the same power. So the gospel is not just about getting saved. The gospel is about living the life God wants us to live. It's the power. You and I don't have it. We didn't have it before we got saved. We have it now because the Holy Spirit lives in us, but it's still not in and of ourselves. It's still the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to help us get through this slander issue or gossip issue or um, pride issue or, or whatever. It's the power of the gospel. And you know what melts me? The power of the gospel comes down to this two laws that we looked at, love. It's love. Like, I, I wish that it was more complicated because I like to study and I wish I could, like, you know, do an exam and say, yes, I passed, I got it. It's not. It's that simple. It's love. So God's love for us, if we truly understand it, like we did when we first got saved, is the same that we need to understand it now when we have to confront stuff in our lives. And it starts with, wow, God, you love me. You're like, you know this stuff, sir? Like, you love, wow, God, wow. All right, can you help me with this slandering thing? Or can you help me with this? Or can you, it's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. So this is what we're going to pray through as we close today. In order to avoid slander, this is the specific thing that James is addressing there. We need to consider what we think of others, what we think of the law, what we think of God, and what we think of ourselves. So let's close our eyes, and let's think about those four areas. Like, what do I think about others in church, you know? What do I think when I look over and I see that person that I know can afford a better pair of shoes than I can? Like, what, what do I think about my brothers and sisters? Like, what do I think about God's law, his word? Like, I mean, yeah, it's the Bible, and we celebrate it, but does it have authority in my life? Like, when I'm at a crossroad, do I go God's way based on his word, or do I just sort of say, no, it'll be okay. After all, I'm pretty smart too, God. Let me help you with what you missed. What do we think of God? Is God the sovereign one? Does he know all and do all for his glory and for our benefit? And what do we think of ourselves? Is there pride lurking that puts us in a space where uh, we're not able to be sympathetic or see others as God would have us because we've got this inflated thought of ourselves? These are the areas that uh, these two verses address, so I want us to consider those. So let's just pray through those right now before we leave, please. One of the things that as a church we need to do in order to not just contribute, as we talked about last week, but to protect is not to slander, not to gossip. And if we find that something slips off of our tongues, you know, we got to repent. If we find that it's gone further and it's impacted on somebody, we got to go handle that and apologize and be broken, be humble. Um, but slander, it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. Can't do that. And so what I'm going to pray is, God, will you continue to unify our church, strengthen it, grow it, that we would have persons committed to be in ministry and use the gifts that God has given for the health of the church, but then also that we would be serious about protecting the unity of the body, which is, no, I'm not sending anyone out on, on, on patrol to go looking for people and stuff. That's not it. But as we interact, first we guard ourselves. And then, if need be, we encourage others to guard themselves because this thing of slander is devastating. It's devastating. And as much as it hurts our personal relationships, it hurts God's heart more. It hurts God's heart more. All right. So let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, God, because you've reminded us afresh this morning, just in a sense, God, how tender your heart is, God. You know, yeah, you're big, you're strong, God, you're omniscient, you're sovereign, God, but your heart is tender, God. And you watch over your church, God, as you have in the old days of your people Israel and now us, God. And uh, Father, it's just who you are, God, and you want to see your church 
function and grow and to be healthy, God, and not to be divided, God. So as we understand this thing called slander, God, and we understand even how that took root in Satan's mind and in his life, God, and the results of that, God, help us, God, not to slander, God. Help us not to look at each other with evil intent there, God. Even in the church, God, help us not to do that, God. Help us, God, to accept your word as from your heart, God. It is law, God. It is your heart codified for us, God, so that we will know what it is that you want us to do. And, Father, help us not to be familiar with you in terms of, oh, the big man upstairs and, you know, we can just hang out or whatever. Yes, God, you do draw us into the intimate relationship with you by your spirit, God, absolutely. But, Father, that has to be understood in the bounds of reverence for you because you're God. You're a holy God. That's just who you are. And Father, I pray that you would help us not to have an inflated opinion of ourselves, God. doesn't matter how old we are, how long we become in the church, or what part of the world we're from, or whatever, God. Help us to live out our lives humbly before you, God, because that gives you glory, God, and you're able to use us for your glory in that way, God. So I thank you for reminding us of that afresh today, God. And I pray that as we leave, you will help us to live it out, God, by the power of your spirit, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. God bless you all. It's good to see you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Lord willing, we'll see you Tuesday, Tuesday for prayer meeting. God bless you. Have a great day. Encourage each other as you leave. This message has been brought to you by... Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request, email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm.